Sure, thank you. All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Ottawa Business Reopening Workshop for day camps and childcare. My name is Lynn Ladd, and I'm proud to be the Director of Membership and Programs at the Ottawa Board of Trade. You may know that the board's mission is to create prosperity through advocacy, collaboration, and leadership. We represent all businesses in Ottawa at every level of government, and we deliver benefits and programs that support a thriving business community. Never before has this been more important. Please visit our website for more information on our organization, our policies, and our member benefits. We're currently creating a special Ottawa reopening strategy with many free programs to support you, including a Business Insights webinar series, business peer groups, and much more. Look for upcoming details on the post promise to inspire confidence in your families um, and employees. We're pleased to offer this workshop series along with our community partners, the City of Ottawa, Ottawa Public Health, and the Ottawa Coalition of Business Improvement Areas. Thank you to City of Ottawa. I think I'm going to just turn on just for a moment. <laughs> Gonna mute a couple of calls here. There we go. Lovely. Um, sorry. Uh, we're pleased to offer this workshop series along with our partners, City of Ottawa, Ottawa Public Health, and the Ottawa Coalition of Business Improvement Areas. I'd also like to thank Cindy Van Buskirk and Brian Vincent at the City, Phil Jansen at Ottawa Public Health, and Mark Koluski at Acobia for your continued collaboration and dedication to our community. We'll begin with a short presentation followed by Q&A, and it's now my pleasure to introduce our presenters for today. Day Camps and Child Care will be presented by Dr. Brent Malachny, Associate Medical Officer of Health with Ottawa Public Health, and Jacqueline Chalifou, uh, Public Health Inspector with Ottawa Public Health. They'll be joined today by uh, Celia L. Sayeg, Public Health Nurse and Community Liaison Lead for COVID-19 at Ottawa Public Health, is this Jennifer Cunningham, the Recreation Supervisor, Recreation, Culture and Facility Services with the City of Ottawa. So Brent, I am going to turn the presentation over to you now. Great, uh, thank you very much and welcome everyone uh, to this uh, webinar today. Um, I'm hearing a little bit of feedback on my line, so please make sure all of your lines are mute because uh, these, these uh, social networking um, things are tend to be quite uh, sensitive. Um, so we're pleased to, to uh, have this opportunity to share information about day camps and childcare. Um, as, uh, as Lynn uh, said, there's a, a short presentation we're gonna provide and then uh, we'll open it up to questions. Um, just in terms of scope, I mean, the focus here is on public health guidance uh, for day camps and childcare settings uh, and for um, reopenings that are as safe as possible. Um, you may have questions, you know, around licensing or funding of childcare. That's not our, our thing. Uh, so, so please, uh, you know, direct those kinds of questions to, uh, to Ministry of Education or uh, the City of Ottawa Children's Services. Um, and also any questions around the City of Ottawa Summer Day Camp program itself should be directed to the Recreation, Culture and Facilities Services Department. Um, and just a brief plug, I mean, you can find guidance, uh, the latest guidance from Auto Public Health, because things change pretty rapidly in this world, uh, on both home-based and center-based childcare on our OPH child care providers webpage. And the guidance for day camps should be on our website if it's not already there uh, later on today. So those are just some interesting, or it's not interesting, I hope they're interesting, but uh, points that I want to make. I am now going to do my best to share my screen to find my slides. There they are. I'm going to say share. I don't know. I told, I told them to go back upstairs not that long. Okay, please mute your, li mute your lines, please. Um, so Lynn, can you see my slides? Okay, because they're, they're appearing somewhere else. So you know what? Uh, let me see if I can move them. No, I can't. They um, are moving for the viewers. Okay, so uh, they're disappearing on a different screen, so it's going to look like I'm turned away. So let me just, 
uh, turn my head a little bit so that uh, it's not too crazy. So again, uh, thank you and, and welcome to this business reopening workshop. Uh, what we're going to do is, is in, in, a, in just a few minutes, provide a, an, an overview of, of current status of COVID, uh, review the reopening guidance for childcare and day camps, uh, including infection prevention and control practices, and highlight some key public health considerations for reopening as safely as possible. Uh, oops, that's a little sensitive. Um, so the good news is that um, uh, due to the efforts of everyone in Ottawa, um, the case counts are decreasing, the hospitalizations are decreasing, uh, our outbreaks are increasingly under control and, and are decreasing, and, and we are following up uh, any cases that are occurring um, to ensure they're isolated and, and that we do contact follow-up. Um, I would point out, though, that we are still having cases. So, so there is a sense among some people that because it's reopening, it's all over, and that's by far not the case. Uh, there's still community transmission. And the actual concern we have is as we reopen and give more opportunities for the virus to be transmitted, that uh, we could be faced with, a, with an increasing problem. Um, so that's why it's really important as we look at trying to start up day camps and childcare that we do it as safely as possible. Um, other good news is that, you know, testing volumes are up, the capacity is increasing. Um, and uh, I've already mentioned about the, the concern about uh, transmission. Um, and the reality is that you know your operations best um, and and really, we're here to provide guidance uh, in terms of how to try and do that as safely as possible so that you can apply it to your particular situation to be able to protect not only your staff, but the children and families that you'll be caring for or providing services to. Um, and and uh, some of this is, is sort of learning by doing in terms of how to best do some of the, the, the tasks. And there's certainly, it's, it's a wise idea to be sharing these sorts of uh, insight uh, with, with your colleagues. Now, in general, um, there's some principles for, for reopening that, that apply regardless of the type of business or setting. Um, first off, I mean, people need to be, to be healthy. I mean, people who are ill or have symptoms should not be at work, uh, should not come to work, and should be tested. Um, it's because uh, it's this virus is still in our community. We need to be maintaining physical distancing at all times as much as possible and we'll be wearing cloth masks when we cannot. Um, hand and respiratory hygiene and the latter of course refers to if you're sneezing or coughing that you're doing it into your sleeve. Um, and the design of our workplace is to enable physical distancing if, if we happen to have groups of people that we've got crowd control and traffic flow um, and signage and that there's regular cleaning and disinfection of, of high touch areas. Um, and if one is using uh, personal protective equipment that one is providing and maintaining it. Now, now for day camps and childcare facilities, I mean, there are a number of things that you need to think about specifically and, and there are issues around registration. Uh, um, in terms of parental consent, and you'll notice that we have a fairly explicit notice of risk. We started doing that for the emergency child care settings because, you know, frankly, as soon as you start bringing children together from different households, you're providing opportunities for increased transmission and parents and uh, guardians, providers, uh, people working in these settings need to be aware of that and, um, and agree to, to, to that. Um, there are certain sort of restrictions and programming requirements. Um, there's a need to ensure individuals with symptoms uh, are not uh, being entered into, into, the, uh, into the camp or childcare facility uh, and the sorts of responsibilities in terms of, uh, of maintaining distancing as, as, as much as possible. Uh, the other issue is at risk populations, certainly as people get older that are at higher risk, so that has an implication for, uh, for providers. It also has an implication for uh, households uh, members. So for example, if you have an elderly person or someone with chronic medical conditions in, in your household, then you need to think about whether you're comfortable then with someone going out of the household and, and being, say, in childcare or day camp with the opportunity perhaps to bring it home and expose others. Um, in terms of health and safety measures to have in place, you know, ensuring you've got a response plan in place, um, that you're only allowing essential people to enter the setting, 
that you have records of those who are entering, uh, that PPE, personal protective equipment is available, and that the staff are trained in all of the procedures. Uh, certainly when the announcement for child care, I think was made early last week. I mean, a number of child care organizations said, well, how, how can we be ready in three days? And the answer is you probably can't. Uh, and you should only open when you're ready to do so. Um, and so active screening, I've already said to remind people, and, and we need to constantly do this, that if you're ill, stay home. Uh, here in Canada, we of course have this thing about, you know, it's just a cold, therefore I can go to work or go to school or go to daycare. Well, in the world of COVID, that's not okay. Um, and so if one has symptoms, one should stay home and get tested. Uh, there needs to be screening of anyone uh, entering the setting daily. Uh, there should be signage um, around, uh, around screening um, and, and the symptoms being assessed. And, and temperature checks are, are, are needed. Um, we sort of have a, a, a graded kind of approach. I mean, the first option is for the parent or guardian to take the temperature at home and report it at sign-in. Um, if that is not feasible, then for the parent or guardian to take the temperature of the child at sign-in. And I guess in exceptional circumstances, if, if the parent or guardian is unable to do that, for the staff to take the temperature, although that will require wearing a PPE because at that point uh, the, uh, the child has not passed screening. Um, in terms of cohorts and groups, uh, this is trying to, to, to find a balance between feasibility and um, reducing the, the risk of, of, of multiple households coming together in a cohort. Uh, so the provincial guidelines, as you're aware of, um, is um, for, for day camps as, as well as in child care to be 10 individuals, um, that in, in day camps is to be cohorting staff and children for a minimum of seven days. Most of them are a week, so that follows that. Uh, and the whole idea of a cohort or a group is for these not to mix, so that if a child becomes symptomatic in one cohort, that the experience exposures are limited to that one cohort and doesn't affect the entire camp or the un entire child care facility if more than one cohort or group is there. So that's the whole principle behind this. Um, and then of course, cleaning and disinfecting shared spaces between cohorts. Um, symptoms, um, I mean, the, the list of symptoms for COVID are pretty long. Um, so, you, so we all have to be ready for, for when a child or a staff person is going to develop symptoms um, and certainly it's important for when that that child or that staff person realize that they have symptoms that they are separated from the rest of their cohort immediately and for the staff person that they go home and for a, a child that the parent or guardian is called and the, and the child is picked up. Um, certainly want to maintain uh, a distance from the child if possible, but that probably won't be that feasible. And so therefore, if you're gonna be within two meters of that child, then, then PPE will be required. Uh, and there needs, the parents need to be notified uh, within the cohort that someone has become sick and, and advise them to monitor symptoms for, for their children. Um, we view that because there's in a cohort uh, and until the, the diagnosis is confirmed as, uh, as COVID that uh, they can continue to attend the program, but, but really be vigilant about maintaining them as a cohort and not uh, mixing in with other cohorts uh, while awaiting uh, testing. Now, if uh, that child or staff do test positive, then public health uh, uh, steps in and, and we will further assess the situation and provide advice in terms of what outbreak control measures are going to be, uh, be required. Uh, in terms of physical distancing, I've already talked about the, the idea of, of not mixing cohorts because it defeats the purpose. We're trying to limit the, the amount of uh, interaction that is occurring and the impacts if someone develops symptoms. Um, so we're, you should be trying to promote activities that encourage space between participants uh, through signage and markers and design and enge engineer the space you have to, uh, to optimize uh, distancing. And, and certainly at this time of year, um, outside is better than inside. Um, it, uh, the risk of transmission is much lower um, outside than, than inside. Uh, for day camps, um, again, it's, it's similar that uh, if, if there is a child that uh, becomes unwell, that they need to be isolated, that the parents or guardians need to be notified to come pick them up. Um, 
the uh, there'll be you know um, some. Uh, I used to, to provide medical uh, support for for day camps, uh, so there can be all kinds of reasons why children have uh, symptoms. So uh, you know the the staff will will need to use a little bit of discretion to give the the child a chance to uh, to uh, have their symptoms resolve. Uh, maybe by sitting in the shade or having a quick drink. Uh, but if it's not resolving very quickly, then uh, then then going into saying that this child has symptoms and uh, and and needs to go home. Um, if uh, if cohorts um, um, are not sufficiently separated or if there's activities where distancing cannot be maintained, especially inside, then we would recommend cloth masks. But re recognizing these are children to, uh, to try and avoid those situations and distancing is better, um, mainly because children are not going to tolerate wearing masks for very long and it's going to be even more problematic on a hot day. Um, Considerations. I mean, this is a different situation for counselors than than running normal day camps. There's a lot more responsibility. There's a lot more issues they need to be concerned with. So, so there's going to be a need for much more training and support than you would typically have in a, in a summer. Um, and be concerned about those situations where the cohorts or groups um, might have the potential to be coming into contact or sharing space, uh, and and need to design that so that uh, they don't intermingle or, or and, uh, uh, and generally speaking that the day camp is not sharing a space uh, with other groups um, such as a, such as a, for example a, a gym. Um, the, there's also limited programming options um, compared to previous years. So for example, no off-site trips and, and no guests coming in. And again, just because of uh, it's easy for the virus to be transmitted indoor than out then to emphasizing outdoor time for the for the participants um, and we'll need to you know have policies and processes in place uh, for children who are, are um, having difficulties uh, complying with distancing and other uh, requirements um, in, ch in for child care um, there are a number of additional uh, sort of considerations um, so for example in home child care um, as well as uh, just children in general shouldn't be, shouldn't be involved in preparing a food um, in, in a home child care provider, limiting interactions with household contacts uh, for, for smaller children with, with nap, uh, having, again, sufficient distancing and, and again, emphasizing outdoor time. Um, there are a number of resources, um, uh, both from the Government of Ontario that are listed here. Um, also, there's some general principles in the City of Ottawa reopening toolkit. Uh, and then there's some specific uh, guidance around childcare and day camps uh, that are available on our website, in addition to all the other information that we have, that we have on COVID-19. So that's uh, what we wanted to, to present to you as, uh, as some, some initial sort of uh, grounding information and we are happy to take questions. I understand there's a, a large number of people that were registered for this event and uh, so we'll do our best to, to handle uh, the, the questions. Those that we don't get to will certainly be reviewing and, and looking for themes and finding ways to be able to, uh, to respond and address the questions that, uh, that you have. So thank you. Thank you, Brent. Um, so I'm going to just start diving into the questions. Um, so I'm just going to remind everybody, please make sure that your mics are on mute and you can put your questions for uh, our team today in the chat and we will get to as many of them as we possibly can. So bear with us, please. So first question, if you are within two meters of the child, should you wear PPEs? I don't know who wants to field that question. I, can you hear me? Um, you're very quiet, Jacqueline. Okay, sorry, I was having some audio issues initially. Um, so I could answer that. So it really depends, it, Are they? do they mean like within their cohort? So if you're within your cohort, um, you've been screened, the children have been screened, Green. Um, you would wear PPE when you're walking around and if you can't maintain the two meter distance then yes you would wear a mask. Thank you Jacqueline. Uh, the next question is, is it mandatory for teachers in the daycare cohorts to wear a mask even though they have been screened when entering the center? 
Only if they can't maintain the two meter distance. So if you're diapering and you're at your close contact with the child, then yeah, you would put on a mask. Next question, in the Public Health June 15th document, it states on page two that staff can wear a cloth mask. Is this for the staff who is considered the screener as well? Um, so the screener um, also needs to wear um, a visor, so they would wear a visor, a cloth mask, and, um, and gloves, and a gown. Thank you. Can the virus be transmitted by clothing? Should staff who take public transportation change their clothes when they arrive at the center? I'm going to leave that one to Brent. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jacqueline. Um, there's no evidence that that clothing in these kinds of settings would uh, would transmit. Uh, certainly, it's reasonable when you get home to 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 immediately change and, and have your, your clothing and your cloth mask go into into the wash. But it's it would not be a, a requirement to to be changing before you uh, before you leave work. Thank you. Is the temperature listed on the public health guidelines of 37.8 accurate for forehead temperatures? So we, we go with the 37.8 regardless of the thermometer, the type of thermometer that's used, but I, I think Brent had some more guidance in terms of laser thermometers. Yeah, no, thanks, Celia. I was about to say the 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 infrared thermometers that that take temperatures from from foreheads are are not particularly reliable. Like they have the advantage because they're touchless, but unfortunately, their performance isn't very good. Uh, depending upon you know what the child has been doing in terms of uh, being active or perhaps having a hat on, can 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 change the, t the temperature that that's done um i was speaking with uh, one of the pediatricians at chio who tried using these for screening staff earlier this year and and basically abandoned it because it really wasn't working out so uh, based on the existing evidence um unfortunately the the touchless infrared forehead thermometers are not reliable there's a follow-up question with respect to the forehead thermometers. Are they accurate enough when used outside? I, I don't think it matters where they're used. Um, it's they're, they're they're just the the nature of them. Um, they're not very reliable. Um, I've I've seen uh, testing where they, they they tried using them and they compared them to a to a gold standard temperature measurement, and they were finding that the um, a, they weren't reliable, and two, they weren't even performing up to the specifications that the manufacturer had said that they were. Um, so that's why, not, unfortunately, saying that it's not a very reliable use method to test temperatures. Um, we also, as, as per the slides, are, are encouraging parents to test at home. Now, realize not everyone can do that, um, but uh, that would be the first choice. Thank you. So before I go to the next question, there's a number of people that are posting, um, what is the best way to take the temperature accurately? I guess I'll continue on. I, I, <laughs> so I think your, your two main options are, are oral or, or um, eardrum. Um, my understanding is the eardrum uh, temperature taking is, is, is more accurate than the forehead. Um, and so those would be the, the two options. Uh, again, at, ideally at home or secondly, having the parent do it uh, in front of you when they, when they arrive. Okay, great, thank you. So I'm gonna go back into the questions in the order that they've been posted. Uh, for the seven day cohort, 
can we offer families one week on, one week off as a part-time option? That would give the opportunities for more families to attend our child care. Yeah. I think that would be up to the agency to determine that protocol. The, the ministry direction is the minimum of seven days. So as long as you meet that requirement, it would be up to the agency to determine if they wanna do that to accommodate more families. Thank you, Celia. And, and it just, I'll just add something. I mean, overall, we're trying to minimize risks for transmission. Um, so while that's a minimum, um, would want to, as much as is feasible, maintain the stability of your cohorts. Um, just, just to um, limit the mingling of different households. Uh, that may not be feasible, but like that's the overall goal here is, is, is minimize the opportunity for mingling amongst different households. We're already bringing in multiple households likely to, to make our cohort of 10. If we're switching that on a frequent basis, then we're just increasing opportunities for exposure. Um, but that needs to be balanced against the operational realities of trying to meet the needs of the families you're serving. Thanks, Brent. Um, so we're on question number seven of 22 so far, just to give you a sense of how we're doing in terms of time. The next question is, are outdoor sandboxes okay for children from one cohort to play in? Yeah, Who would I, like to answer that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's fine. So you could uh, yeah. just one cohort at a time. If you have any other equipment that you could easily clean and disinfect um, in between the cohorts going outside, then that would you would, that's what you would do. So if you have any toy houses or anything like that, you would clean and disinfect those. But as for sandboxes, uh, one cohort at a time and any little toys in the sandbox, you clean and disinfect. Great, thank you. Um, next question, are waiting pools included in off-site trips? I'm not sure. Yeah, you know what? I'm not sure either. And this is this is the first of, of maybe perhaps more than one example of, of questions that we maybe haven't thought of or that we'll need to take away. Uh, we sort of anticipated this, so we'll take a note of, of these questions and, and find an answer and, uh, and and get it back out to you. Thank you. As far as city day camps go, we are not allowing the staff to take the children to trips to waiting pools. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, next question, how do we deal with teething and allergies? Who would like to answer that for us? I guess it depends on what you actually mean by the question because um, you know sometimes low-grade fevers are attributed to teething and and I don't think we could comfortably do that in this context I mean if, if a child has a fever over 37 8 they have a fever over 37 8 and uh, uh, we, we could assume that oh, maybe it's just teething and it's not COVID or something else. So I think for the safety of everyone, considering we're in a pandemic, uh, if the child has a fever, they have a fever and we, we would need to, to um, behave a, a accordingly. Uh, for allergies, um, I'm assuming, uh, and, I, and I may be assuming wrongly, but I'm, I'm, let me just go with what's immediately on top of mind is that maybe this is uh, with respect to it being a runny nose or, uh, or nasal congestion. Uh, the symptom list uh, put up by the ministry that's re reflected in the guidance does allow for um, a pass on, on, on our runny nose and nasal congestion if there's a, you know, a clear diagnosed history of, of, uh, of allergies versus this is suddenly, for example, the first time this is happening and you think it might be allergies, that would be a different situation and wouldn't feel comfortable with that. Thank you. <clears throat> 
the next question is, and I think this might go to Brent again, parents are asking how we can distinguish between a common cold and COVID since they are so, since they are so similar and how long should they remain at home for monitoring in the event they don't want to have their child tested? Yeah, no, great question. And it's really tough. Um, you know, I've had actually personal circumstances in my family where, you know, I've come in and someone says, I just have a cold and sort of the rest of the family members turn and go, what? Because uh, there is nothing, it, it, there is nothing like just a cold at the moment. And the symptoms really overlap. Like when we started out back in, I don't know, January, February, we were really emphasizing sort of the more severe presentations, you know, the fever and the cough and the difficulty breathing. And, and we've realized over time that that's just the severe um, presentation and that most people, especially younger people, have a much milder version of this, which frankly is indistinguishable from a cold. Um, so, I mean, the easiest thing is, is, is for testing. Um, I can appreciate that someone, uh, for whatever reason, may not want to do that. Um, at that point, because we don't know and we're not reassured, even if they're better, say, in a couple of days, uh, what it was, that uh, it would be 14 days from onset of symptoms before you'd be able to return. Uh, and that's assuming that you've been symptom-free fully for at least 24 hours. Thank you. Next question, if a staff member is fully geared in PPE, can they go into more than one room? I don't, I would say no. Um, the idea is that you stay with the same, um, the same group for the seven days. Um, even though you have PPE, it's been known that the, that individuals always break, break the barriers of their mask or they're often touching their face, but um, I would say no. But what do you think, Brent? Yeah, I mean, I my brain jumps to, you know, sort of unique situations where you're trying to cover uh, because someone is sick or something and you're still trying to give care to the children but I don't it as a routine practice no because you're, you're basically violating the, the cohorting and um, it giving an opportunity for 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 mixing or transmission between the two groups so in, in general no um, keep keep the, keep the cohort separate thank you this is an interesting question. As a preschool with part-time programs where some days children come Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, and other comes Tuesdays and Thursdays, how do we stick to a cohort for seven days? Who wants to tackle the logistics of that one? Well, I think it's the same idea where is, as long as all the Tuesday children are staying together for, you know, perhaps, that one's hard if they're only coming in on Tuesdays. I think if there's a seven day gap and there's cleaning and disinfecting in between. Um, I think those situations will have to be on a case by case basis, depending on your facility setup. Um, uh, I almost think I need more detail, uh, like yeah. like how many kids are we talking about and what's the schedule and trying to provide the best advice because I can, I, my brain is immediately going to all different kinds of scenarios, which may not actually be it, but I think this one is, you know, maybe an offline consult yeah. just to sort of work through the detail. Brent, I can um, link up the attendee who posted that question and get it, make sure that you know who it is so that you can speak with them later. Okay, sounds good. Um, I think the next question is a little out of scope, so I'll, I'll let OPH and, uh, address this and, and say whether or not we can answer it today. If we have parents telling us that they want to return, but only in the third week of our reopening week, uh, because they are nervous around returning right away, how will funding be impacted? All of our clients are on fee subsidies. 
Yeah, so as I, as I said at the beginning, we, we don't deal with the, the funding issue and you'd have to do that through the, through the agency or um, the ministry or the other child care coordination groups. Thank you. Instead of masks, are shields as effective? A shield would allow us to flip up the shield when we are physically distant and allow children to see us. This is important for developing our relationship. I'll, I'll, I'll go first and, and uh, Jacqueline might have a, a, an option. And this question has come up a fair bit um, in different settings. The, the challenge is that for the most part, the, the shields are to um, stop and, and um, droplets to, to, to your eyes. Um, so that's why um, when Jacqueline was talking about the screening procedure where she said a mask and a shield, because we're, trying to prevent uh, the droplets that, that someone is, uh, is expressing as they talk and speak or breathe even. Um, and the, the airflow as you t breathe in and out can go around the mask, I'm sorry, around the face shield. Uh, so that's why a face shield is not considered an equivalent to wearing a mask. Um, totally get the, the issue of um, the sort of the facial content um there there are the marketplace is changing uh this issue has also been raised by uh, uh populations who who depend upon reading uh lips and facial expression um and so there are more masks becoming available that are transparent to to be able to see the facial expression or or the the speech um, but unfortunately, at this point of our understanding, uh, the face shield are not an equivalent protection as a, uh, as, a, as a mask. Thank you. The next question is uh, for young children, ages three and younger, in a home child care context, how do you advise and enforce distance between children and prevent social interactions between them? That's a tricky situation. Who would like to answer that? Hi everyone. So our guidance states as much as possible. We know that especially with children, maintain that two meters is tough, which is why we have those screening questions. Um, and then the other piece to consider is if childcare providers are holding infants and toddlers, that they use a blanket or a cloth um, to and they're breaking that two meters, so just using that extra barrier of the blanket or cloth when holding those children. But in terms of the kids actually playing together, um, having more activities that would promote individual playing or playing kind of separately, doing more things outside, having more outdoor activities. Not going to be an easy task, is it? Especially, no, it's, it's not. And so that's why, um, so it's a little bit of design um, and as Celia said, um, uh, you know, trying to, to set up play a little bit at least separate from each other, being outside versus inside. But I think intrinsically to, to these guidelines is recognizing that there, there probably will be some, some chances for uh, interaction and, and that's why the, the cohorting. So that if, if a child does uh, become ill, that it limits the number of ch other children that have been exposed. Thank you. The next question, uh, you mentioned that public health is notified if there is a confirmed case of COVID. My understanding from other communications is that public health must be contacted if a child or staff is sent home with having symptoms. Um, so maybe if somebody could just uh, elaborate on, on how Ottawa Public Health is notified and who is responsible for making those notifications to them. Sure. So um, basically any positive uh, COVID case is automatically directly uh, notified from the, the laboratory to, to public health. But um, there is a responsibility on behalf of the child care provider to, to notify us as well. Um, so we should actually be hearing from, from two places. We should be hearing from a lab and we should be hearing from the child care provider saying, listen, 
uh, we've got a case, what, what should we do? Um, the, uh, in, in looking at the, the guidance uh, and talking to our, our public health colleagues and other health units, uh, we don't feel it makes sense to, to involve us on every time a child has developed symptoms. Uh, so they're, they're, we do not view it as a requirement of a day camp or a um, child care to notify us if a child has symptoms and to follow the guidance that we have. Certainly if you have a question, and saying, listen, I'm not quite sure how this applies. Feel free to call our outbreak line. But uh, other than that, we don't feel a need to, to be notified every time a child uh, has some symptoms. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Um, sorry, I just lost my place in the question. Um, yes, here we go. Will information or resource sheets uh, be made available or are they already available from Ottawa Public Health to clearly explain cleaning and disinfecting procedures? Yeah, so that information is posted on our website under the child care providers page. So within the guidance documents for home and center-based child care, there is a, a section on cleaning and disinfecting. And then it also links to further guidance on a different page at Ottawa Public Health website that talks more about environmental cleaning so it is um it is online and i can send you that link lynn afterwards that we can send to everybody on the call we did uh, attach several resources to uh in advance yesterday for our guests here today so i believe that document you're just referring to has already been provided and of course they can go to the auto public health website for more information yeah uh, the next question, um, in Quebec, starting this Monday, they're allowing the 10 cohort groups of kids to stop social distancing because they realized it was too hard to implement. Uh, do you think this, this would change in Ontario too? Um, I think Ontario is following um, the experience and, and how other uh, jurisdictions are uh, implementing. Um, this is the guidance that we have now from, from, from the Ministry of Health, and, and so that's what we're following. Uh, certainly, if things change, uh, then certainly we will pass that information on to everyone. Okay, thank you. In terms of serving food to each cohort, I understand the children can't be involved with serving. However, can the educators still spoon out serving? Um, I could answer that one. The idea around food is that you don't want children serving themselves. And there's also, I got asked this question a lot over the week uh, during my inspections. Um, we also don't want parents providing snacks for the whole group for the whole cohort. So I know that was an issue. Um, so the, the educator is allowed to spoon out the food to individual bowls. And then if we, if a child wants a second serving, you would use a new spoon and divvy out some more. Thank you. I have a two part question regarding cleaning procedures. Uh, the first part is, how do you feel about using UV light for disinfecting and can steam cleaning kill the COVID-19 virus? Uh, I, you know what, I think that's why yeah, I'm, I, I don't feel comfortable enough to give a definitive answer. I think let's add that to our, our list of, of, of questions. I think it's going to come with caveats as to what we're cleaning and, and, uh, and that, but that's a technical question. So we can take that offline and uh, find an answer and get it back to people. Okay. Our next question is a request for clarification. Could you please clarify the PPE that is required for the educators to use while interacting with children in the program? Our understanding is that they are not required and that they need to wear mask and face shield if physical distancing cannot be maintained. Yeah, that's right. So when you're screening, so the screener has to wear a mask and a face shield. Once you've been screened and you're going in the room with your cohort, um, you only have to wear PPE if you can't maintain the two meter distance. So if you were going to 
be changing a diaper, for instance, where you're kind of in that personal space. Thank you. Can we wash all staff's cloth masks? Uh, sorry, Sir Jacqueline, can I just double check something with you <laughs> on that? Uh, just because there's different kinds of masks. So, so as people are coming in, we haven't, we have, they haven't passed screening, so we're worried that they might uh, have COVID. So you need to be having your PPE. So you need your mask, face shield, gown, and gloves. Yep. So then they pass screening, and, and we're now into care mode. Certainly if a child becomes symptomatic and ill yep. until the parent comes, then we're back in our full PPE because we're worried that they could transmit infection to us. That's right. But if we're, you know, so I'm an I'm a ECE and I'm caring for my group of three or five children um, and providing supervision, um, if I'm going to perhaps violate my, that, that two meter distance, would that not be a cloth mask in that situation? Yeah, you would definitely have a mask. Okay. Yeah. You wouldn't need the full PPE that you would have for screening? No, just the mask. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next question. Can we wash all staff's cloth masks together in the washing machine at the center and redistribute clean cloth masks to the, the next day to staff? Or do they need to take their masks home and wash them independently? I don't think we've had this question before. So I'm gonna give a preliminary answer and we're gonna add this. So someone please write, Celia, I see you're writing this down. Let's, we'll double check. Um, I, I think that we're, we're pretty confident that this virus is not gonna survive a washing machine cycle. Um, it doesn't like soap. Um, it's got a bit of a fatty envelope on it that, that requires it to, it needs its envelope in order to infect people. So putting it through a wash with soap, um, the higher the temperature, the better, um, will, should be sufficient. So I could see, and I could see why a, um, uh, a child care facility would want to be able to do this as a service, that it should be fine to be able to then pre redistribute. But um, uh, we will double check um, to make sure there's something that we're not thinking of because we haven't dealt with that question before. So preliminary answer for you. So for day camps, um, we are giving the option for staff to bring their own cloth mask from home. Beyond that, if they don't have one and they require a mask, then we're going to have disposable ones available to them. We will not be providing them with cloth masks um, and making sure that they're responsible if they choose to wear their own cloth mask, that they have it a, an extra one, you know, in case it gets soiled, that sort of thing, that they can change them, and also that they're responsible for washing them, them themselves at home if that helps. Yeah, no, that'd be a great thing to do. Um, the issue is, of course, is there, is, is there anything wrong if a facility wanted to be able to provide this as a service? So we'll double check. We think it's okay, but we will double check. But thanks, thanks for that uh, additional info. So the next question is also a request for clarification, and it's a very important one because it's a very fundamental issue. Does the mask protect the person who wears it, or should we wear one to protect others. And if you have the shield on, do we still need to wear a mask? Okay. So, so, so it depends. So let me go through a couple of different scenarios here. So when you're screening and you have your mask and shield and, and gown, and gloves, we, you're re, we're really trying to protect uh, the screener. Um, and so that's that situation. So when you're in care mode and you've got your cloth mask on uh, and you, you know, you might need to do something within the two meters. The, the protection um, is, is mainly for the child and for the others. So, so when we're wearing cloth masks, the protection is more for others than ourselves. Um, so when we're in situations, say what the grocery store or on transit, it, and we're wearing a uh, cloth mask, it's to protect each other. Um, so s similarly, in, in a ch child care setting or a day camp, when we're wearing a cloth mask, we're trying to prevent our droplets from going to other people. Thank you. Although there is a little bit of protection the other way as well, but it's predominantly outwards. Great, thank you. 
Um, next question, do greeters and screeners need to change their gloves between the children they get company to their room from the greeting area? Yes, so gloves should be changed between each client interaction. That's a nice straightforward answer, thank you. <laughs> Next question. When screening, should we be asking if families have traveled outside of the country or outside of the province? Yes, it should be as part of the screening, um, whether they have traveled outside of Canada. Um, because anyone who's been outside of Canada for the 14 days afterwards, they should be in quarantine. And interprovincial travel? It, it, it's no, um, for, for a couple of reasons. So the, the quick answer is no. Uh, the, the feasibility is that, I mean, about a third of the workforce in, in Ottawa comes from Quebec. Uh, so for us, it doesn't make sense uh, for, the, for that to, to, to occur. And certainly the folks in uh, the Gatineau have, have, at the moment, at least less, uh, less COVID than, than we've had in recent weeks. So no, it doesn't make sense to do interprovincial, um, but it's certainly absolutely for international. Thank you. Next question. Would it be recommended that we group our cohorts by family? If you have a young toddler with twin brothers in preschool, do you cohort them together in the preschool program since they are siblings? So I think, I think if I understand that question correctly, they have children of different ages, not necessarily typically in the same grouping. Should they all be placed together in the same cohort? So again, the principle for, for this is we're trying to minimize as much as possible the mixing between households, uh, recognizing that it's, it's going to occur to a some extent, but the extent to which we can minimize the number of households in a cohort, that's um, ideal. So again, if at all possible, um, to have children from the same household in the same cohort. Thank you. And yes, that will mix up your ages a little bit more than usual. Um, and it's going to be an issue for the day camps in particular, but it will also be an issue for, ch for, ch for childcare as well. Okay. Next question is, this one's a two-part question. If we have, the first part is, if we have individual kits for sensory activities, can we reuse it with the same child the next day? We'll have to give that one some thought. Um, I think that will be a question we'll get back to. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the second part of this person's question is, what do you feel about sprinklers and water play in the very hot weather as it relates to COVID-19? Um, I'm not sure what the concern is um it's uh, like it allows for play um they're outside uh you can encourage some distancing um i i you know we we do have our splash pads uh, have opened up in the city um for for children to use uh, you know the messaging there for parents is supervise uh maintain distancing um in that case, there's potentially buttons and stuff. So there's additional issues about high touch surfaces and telling people to use elbows and, 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 and use hand sanitizer. Uh, but uh, as, a, as a play activity, I, I, I think that's okay. Jacqueline, have you have any concerns? Yeah, I agree. I think it's fine. Um, you're, if they're just running around in a sprinkler, it, it, I think it's okay. And even for the water play in con with containers, I think if you give every child their own container and they could all play together, but then in their own kind of safe space, then that's a good idea too. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. You just don't want everyone huddled over one big jug of water. So the next question is actually a great follow-up. Somebody specifically wants to know about um, the small wading pools. So I'm presuming that means, you know, one of the plastic ones that you can go and purchase at Walmart or something like that. I think again, it has to do with maintaining um, distancing. So if you purchase more than one and um, 
you know, and they're, they're fill and dump at the end of, of their play time. So um, that's going to be to your discretion, I would think. Um, just keep in mind that you have to maintain a physical distance. So. Thank you. The next question is, our toddlers normally bring their own snacks and lunch. Is that still allowed? Yes. And they would just simply, I presume, maintain physical distancing between the children and, okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and not share. <laughs> yeah, no sharing. Next question. Uh, somebody has asked for some clarification regarding sandboxes. When you say one cohort at the time in the sandbox, do you mean that the sandbox is reserved to one cohort or that one cohort can use the sandbox and then shortly thereafter another cohort can use the sandbox? I, I, Brent, if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah. One I, at a time, so. so I, I let me give a preliminary answer, and I think we'll go back and again think it's you know this is kind of why we wanted to do this because we knew there were these questions we probably didn't hadn't thought of, and you're you're flagging a bunch of them. Um, my preliminary answer would be that um, after children of one cohort use it, you would need to disinfect sort of the high touch. Yet, so as Jacqueline said earlier, you'd need to disinfect the toys, but you would also, like I'm thinking of like the turtles and the red ones, I can't remember what animal it was uh, that yeah. kids had years ago. The crabs, yeah, that, that, you know, because the kids have had, had their hands all over that, I mean, you, that's a high touch surface. Uh, it is outside in the sun, but I, I think you would wipe that down with a disinfectant cloth before the next COVID, uh, the next COVID the next cohort uh, would be coming in. Slip yeah, anything on. that could be cleaned and sanitized, you clean and sanitize it. If it's, if, if it's a, an item that can't be cleaned and sanitized, well then. Don't share. Yeah. Great. Uh, next question. Are all families coming to daycare still allowed their own 10 person bubble or is the daycare their new 10 person bubble? So I, th I think that refers back to Ontario oh, yeah. Public Health uh, recommendations. That is a great question because, um, of course, we've got um, our, our uh, social circle, the 10 person social circle. I have, I don't think I've seen an answer to the, or that question posed, but it is an interesting question. Uh, Celia is busy writing that one down and we will get back to you on that. And Celia, all of these questions are, are captured in the chat, and I'll have a transcription of that for you, so you don't need to write all the questions down. Sorry, I should have told you that earlier. That's amazing. Thank you, Lynn. No problem. Our next question is, is it okay to wear an apron? An, an apron during screening? I'm going to presume it's an apron either during craft time or, oh, uh, my colleague is saying it's during lunch. Sure, if you want to. Yeah, I would think it's, 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 it's another piece of clothing that, that if you don't wear the apron, then whatever your, your work clothes are just going to get you know soiled by whatever you're concerned about moving so i yeah i i would think it'd be it'd be reasonable again it's as long as it's not being used between cohorts um that that would that it's just another form of clothing um next question can you use the same bottle of sunscreen for a whole group if you are washing your hands before and after each child application So our current recommendation is for each child to bring their own sunscreen. Um, again, a preliminary answer, and I'm going to turn to Dr. Brent for, for further guidance. If you squeeze the bottle of sunscreen and you touch the child, you might kind of go back for more, you know what I mean? Like unless you wash your hands every time you go before you touch the bottle of sunscreen, there could be some transmission 
infection going on. So you definitely need to wash your hands in between each client, but you know, sometimes you don't have enough sunscreen, you go back to the bottle and you squeeze more. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's that be the concern is, is you'd almost, if you were trying to do it with a common one, you'd be having to wash your hands every time before you touch the sunscreen. Mm -hmm. So I received this question um, because there's some child cares that have bought big bulk um, containers of sunscreen. So what I have advised them to do is to go and buy little bottles that they could fill with that sunscreen for every individual child that they would label. Once the bottle is empty, they would clean because you can't top up. So they would clean and disinfect it and then reuse it. That's a practical suggestion. Thank you. Yeah, it is. Uh, the next question, I'm, I'm not 100% sure I understand what they're asking here, is uh, what about people going on holidays? Though I don't know if that refers to staff going on holidays or the family. Families. So, I mean, the most obvious problem with that is if they're going out of Canada because when they come back they're going to need to be in quarantine for two weeks other than that um, it to me it wouldn't be different from joining a child care facility for the first time like you're going to enter a cohort so you've been away on a vacation you're going to come back um, if you can go back into the same cohort, that would be great. Uh, but other than that, I think you're just starting the clock again when you come back. Any, any other thoughts, team? Yeah, okay. I don't think there's any difference. I think it's like if you decide to take a day off from your cohort, then you just come back to the same cohort when you come back. Um, so. Yeah, our position is if they haven't traveled outside of Canada and they can they pass all the uh, like the screen components, then it's fine. Okay, I'm just noticing the time and we've gone slightly over our 2 p.m. cutoff and to be respectful of everybody's agendas and calendars, we are going to bring this webinar to a conclusion. I just want to remind everybody that every single one of your questions has been captured in the chat. It will be shared with Ottawa Public Health and the City of Ottawa so they can review your questions and make sure that they have uh, answers for all of them. I wish you all a very safe reopening. I hope that your businesses flourish and take off again. And uh, I'm quite sure that if you, uh, have any further comments or questions, if you need copies of the resources that were distributed, you can reach out to me. I can hook you up with the right people at Ottawa Public Health, or you can contact them directly. Um, so I'd like to uh, thank uh, Jacqueline, Brent, and Celia today, and of course, Jennifer for her input and for sharing this information. And uh, have a wonderful, beautiful afternoon and good luck with your reopenings. I hope it goes very smoothly for everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.